Thank you very much, Penny, and thanks everyone for coming today. Um, as Penny said, that this um, session really was inspired by the work that we've been doing through this project, um, and it's also a conversation that we're carrying on from uh, an earlier conference uh, at CHAGS in Dublin earlier in the year. So we're really, really excited to be expanding this. Um, and what I'm going to do and share with you today is the preliminary results of this project. Um, and we've been looking into the colonial connotations of language that's been used to describe the Mesolithic Neolithic transition in Northwest Europe. And we're doing this specifically within uh, material culture, just as a small sample of what we might have encountered. So it's... Uh, the Mesolithic Neolithic transition is a topic that I'm sure uh, is not unfamiliar to you. Um, so I'll kind of very briefly go through this slide. But as we can see from this diagram, it's, uh, it, it, it spans a, a very, very long time, again around 12,000 years ago in the early Holocene. And we have modes of subsistence that change from largely hunting, gathering and fishing practices to ones that are based on pastoralism um, and uh, of domesticates and agriculture. So, of course, with this spread and with the movement of peoples and new ideas, new life ways and ways of doing things, we see different technologies, we see different belief systems, and of course the recent developments that we have um, in, in terms of the ancient DNA uh, have shown that um, the movement of people have facilitated this very, very quickly. And I think my slide transition has not worked, so you're just here with the map. Um, so. Within this, uh, the history of, of archaeology, the so-called um, cultural package that defines the Neolithic has been very, very well established since the 19th century. But by contrast, it's the Mesolithic that was not really fully recognised until the 20th century. Uh, that is under the full reign uh, of the, the British Empire at this time um, and all the prevailing social attitudes of the time. And we see how these attitudes have been captured within early descriptions of the periods. So we see that the Mesolithic was seen as a, a great hiatus between uh, the Neolithic and the preceding Paleolithic of the Pleistocene. Um, the, Pleistocene the Paleolithic was praised for its high culture as embodied by the cave art that we see in Southern Europe. Um, and uh, this is in, in spite, essentially, of its um, apparent savagery, which we see uh, described in these quotes. Um, for example, uh, Veergaard and Child uh, had, uh, had described it um, as uh, a, 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 a savage, savage culture, uh, but producing something so dazzling. Um, and uh, a popular author and illustrator, Norman Alt, uh, who was writing at the time, does describe the Mesolithic as a dark transitional period of struggle and trial that melts insensi insensibly into the pastoral and agricultural civilization of the Neolithic age. And I put a deliberately air quotes on civilization and, and, and a strong emphasis on that. Um, and then we have from the material culture perspective, uh, Graham Clark commenting that it's hard to think that pottery was invented separately and independently by the strand loopers of the Terina coast, um, more likely it had arrived as part of what was, was termed that, um, that Neolithic revolution. So, within these attitudes and, and, and these uh, epistem epistemological issues of, of, of raised, as a consequence, the tropes, they continue to pervade through literature, through reconstructions, um, as much as we like to think that we're trying um, to, uh, to, to fight this, uh, it's still there. And uh, this image, which um, Penny found uh, from, uh, uh, which is one of the icon most iconic texts on the transition uh, in the Danube region, we can see how the Neolithic farmers who are, who are on the left, um, they are fully clothed, they have woven textiles, they've got pottery, and they've got their domesticated ram, um, and they're uh, encountering these, these Mesolithic hunter-gatherers to the right, um, it, it, this, uh, the, have indigenous uh, created pottery there, um, but of course negligibly clad, uh, as uh, often hunter-gatherers are perceived uh, to, to be, uh, despite it's well those conditions of the Holocene wouldn't be unknown on a winter's day like today and as we all know it's pretty chilly out there um, and of course the, um, the the earliest domestic the dog so at its core we see that the the transition really has been almost exclusively defined in subsistence terms uh, and we recognize of course that we are guilty ourselves as labeling uh, Mesolithic peoples as hunter-gatherers uh, and all the um, connotations that that brings with it as well uh, Pollard has crit criticised um, the reductive functionalist and ecological frameworks that characterise these narratives. 
um, and that this creates a misleading impression of hunter-gatherer communities as less complex behaviourally. Um, and this really others the Mesolithic as passive agents who are living in this utopian world of plenty, uh, the, uh, the policy maximum, uh, yet they only seem to exist to manufacture uh, tools and kind of wander aimlessly and listlessly around the landscape in search of the ne next meal. These, these tropes still seem to pervade that there is an absence of culture here. Whereas we see with the Neolithic, conversely, uh, it's something far more familiar and to the general public as well. So it's something, it's a, it's a lifeway subsistence strategies that is very, very familiar to the majority um, of, of uh, people who live today within urbanised societies. And um, so the, the beginnings of ag agriculture really see it as a, as a traditionally an event that allowed human groups to create the systems of production that in the long run led to present day society. So it is something that's much more familiar and, uh, and more recognisable. So this um, further emphasises the perceptions of otherness of, of hunter-gatherer societies, both in the past and in the present as well. But we don't claim uh, to, through the project that we've done, to be the first to try and attempt to, uh, to challenge what John Robert terms uh, the epistemology of Neolithic transitionality transitionology, try saying that. Um, so over the last decade, really, with, there's been a, a lot of attempts to do this and, 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 and raise these issues and, uh, and change the course of the narrative uh, that has been so embedded. Um, and the Neolithic revolution, uh, air quotes again, has been, been deconstructed from a range of different avenues. So tackling models that we use to explain the spread of Neolithic life ways uh, through the dominance of domestication as central to subsistence, the types of um, social organisation and political economy that is associated with um, agriculture and urbanisation, and of course, landscapes and material culture. And we see that um, there's also been attempts to forefront the autonomy of hunter-gatherers within this process. So in this vein, the aim of our research has been to, to challenge the legacy of colonial language, to actually look about the way in which scholars have written about this tr transition and how this continues to inform and dictate the research questions that we ask about this period. So we want to explicitly identify terms that are used uh, to various, uh, to describe these various aspects of the period in research outputs. So by doing this, we hope that we can better educate ourselves in and understand the impact that certain words have. And by doing this, try to reflect on what effect this has when we're developing the research questions that we're asking of, of the transition. So when we put our methodologies together, when we put our big grant applications in, what is it that we're trying to ask? What is it we're trying to find out? And just be more self-aware about those types of questions. So um, you might have um, uh, I've kind of deliberately put in some subtle nuances about the way that, uh, for example, we say that Mesolithic people were clad in furs, whereas Neolithic people were clothed. And these kind of have even these subtleties within language really, really are very, very loaded. So it's, it's the connotations of these small differences that are, are really, really problematic. Um, so Emily, our fabulous intern, has been doing, did a lot of work, uh, so thank you very much, Emily, um, to look at uh, essentially five archaeological journals, uh, and these are they, uh, over the period from 1950 or the journal start date to uh, present day, and which um, she, uh, was able to access them. Um, and essentially, we looked for what well, we, Emily, looked for uh, certain things. So looking at chronology, so identifying articles that were focused on the Mesolithic, on the Mesolithic Neolithic transition and also the Neolithic exclusively with a geographic region of Britain and Ireland and Europe. So some of them focused more exclusively on Britain and Ireland, some of them focused more exclusively on Europe, and three different types of material culture. Now, obviously, we are aware that more material ex culture exists than this, but this is just a very small pilot study. So what is it? Where can we see these differences in some of the main uh, features that we see as terms of differences? So looking at houses, looking at lithics, and looking at, looking at pottery. So, of course, we do have pottery using Mesolithic cultures within this study as well. We see that uh, there's change in lithic technology is something that differs stylistically. So that was the reason for that. Um, and what did Emily find? So uh, of the articles that Emily was able to access, 704 were identified as fitting this criteria. 
Um, and there was a really interesting increase in ask course post uh, 2000, which was quite an interesting trend in itself. And if anyone has any ideas why this might be the case, we're very welcome to receive them because we're not sure why. But um, notably within the lifetime of the study, there have been almost as many publications in the 30 months uh, of, uh, of, of the, that it, it ran as in, in the entire of the 1950s, for example. So really a, a huge increase uh, in, in publications that are focusing on these periods, which is great news um, for prehistorians. So that was really wonderful. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, Emily found that the articles that focus exclusively on the Neolithic are overwhelmingly dominant, essentially, uh, within those uh, terms of those numbers of publication. Uh, and this is followed by greater representation of those that just deal with the transition rather than just the Mesolithic. So even in and of itself within research culture, the Mesolithic is still inherently understudied. Um, and despite the international scope of these journals that were targeted, we saw that Britain and Ireland uh, dominate the focus of the publications. That might be because as, an, as islands, uh, they've drawn more research focus uh, in terms of the spread and, and movements. And anecdotally, um, also Emily noticed that there was a distinct use of more active language when referring to the Neolithic, whereas Mesolithic is described in more passive terms. And the, the themes around these waxed and waned uh, according to basically what's sexy in archaeology right now. For example, DNA is the hot topic at the minute. Uh, and DNA, of course, um, we have seen uh, in rare cases being co-opted into nationalist and race, racist narratives of origin. Uh, and used to argue against supporting uh, modern day immigration. So we felt that really that it was a, you know, the time was ripe to, to, to be tackling this. There's some interesting data about uh, the uh, uh, from the 1950s. So um, showing that there's a, a focus on lithics in terms of material culture. So which as a lithic person, that's great for me. I, I love lithics. Um, but uh, we also um, uh, and the, the Neolithic, uh, we see uh, other, um, other focus. And of the 75 instances where houses are mentioned, 20% uh, of these came from a single article uh, on the Neolithic by Brysov uh, in the European region of the former USSR. Um, and this is just quite an interesting case study in and of itself, because uh, it's a really interesting uh, information in terms of, of language that's used to describe dwellings, uh, though we need to sort of establish the, the background context in terms of um, how Child had described in 1949, the prehistoric soil of Europe was literally riddled with pit dwellings and in which people must have huddled together. So I'm deliberately emphasizing those words again. And Child had criticized uh, this as, as resulting from the wraiths from Tacitus and Xiphilinus combining in the minds of 16th century antiquarians with more exact traveler's tales of earth lodges of the Red Indians that caused this overcrowding of the pits. So acknowledging the fact that um, there had been ethno early ethnographies that were being shoehorned in to fit the archaeological record uh, as early as the 16th century. And we can see how these um, embedded colonial attitudes from the time already were within the interpretation of archaeological features. And then he goes on to describe that how in the 1940s work has revealed commodious houses that were inhabited by farmers around the Danube rather than these subterranean silos and styes. Goodness me. But that's not to say that Child's belief was that the pit dwellings he described were uh, as such were inhabited by people, but rather the exact opposite. But then nevertheless, he does uh, remark later on how frankly surprising it is uh, that people uh, quite as uh, uncultured as the, the Calcolithic battle axe culture uh, were always described as uh, nomadic, uh, erecting such substantial houses. So there's a bit of a conflict uh, there within those duality of terms. So it reveals that despite his earlier comments, uh, the spaces that characterise mobile and sedentary populations are further emphasised by the summation of evidence that hunter fishers of the north inhabited round huts, but the first farming societies lived in more substantial dwellings. So it was Child's work that influenced this paper by Brysov, uh, in which he describes a, a, the same consensus amongst Soviet archaeologists that Neolithic people predominantly lived in pit dwellings, yet the investigations in the temperate forest zones of the European continent had seen actually a dominance instead of ground level wooden houses, uh, and thus that following Child, uh, man did not have to bury himself in pits. So I just thought that was a very sort of interesting aside. 
So of course, we're in our, our very early stages of the project. We'd like to continue this in terms of funding, uh, but we've got, we'd like to con uh, conduct more further in-depth analysis of the, of the literature, uh, think about Mesolithic pits versus houses as a clear example of how colonial language and attitudes have shaped research so far, uh, and a, a bigger conversation about language itself and the way that we frame our questions. So this is why we set this session up. We'd like to invite you to discuss uh, around this. We're hoping as one of our outputs to produce a, an open access glossary uh, that can be used with, with terms, not as a, um, oh no, no, this is a naughty word, you shouldn't use it, but more of a just think reflects what types of connotations might this word have that you potentially hadn't considered. Um, so we uh, we really hope to um, to do this, and uh, of course we're having these further conversations at TAG, which is excellent. So um, thank you very much to all these folks, uh, and particularly for Emily for uh, doing such amazing research. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you very much.